there, welcome back to Lima Bean Living. In today's video, I am sharing how I make sourdough bread. So the night before, I took out my starter from my fridge and I just let it like sit under the light of my microwave on top of my stove and kind of let it just get to room temperature. And this is what it looked like the morning that I planned on feeding it and making and assembling my sourdough dough. We will actually be baking the bread the following day. So to start, I am just measuring out how much starter I'm dealing with. I know that my mason jar weighs about 396 grams, so I'm just doing the math here to see how many grams of starter I'm working with. Now, I could go ahead and discard maybe 50 to 100 grams of starter, keep it in another jar, just set it in the fridge for discard recipes. But on this day, I just figured I'd work with the 164 grams of starter that, you know, I had in my jar. But what I'm doing here is I'm measuring out the same amount of grams in water as I have my starter. So I'm keeping my 164 grams of starter and I want to get around 164 grams of water as well. And once I have this amount, measured out, I'm going to go ahead and warm it in the microwave until it gets to about 90 degrees. So this water ended up being a little too hot, so I'm just going to add a little bit more bottled water so that it gets to the temperature that I want, and then I'm just going to pour in 164 grams into my jar that has starter in it. Okay, so the water is now in the jar, and now we're just going to measure out the same amount in grams of bread flour and add that into my little mason jar as well. Now, bread flour is more expensive than like all-purpose flour, and so I typically just use this bread flour for feeding my starter, and sometimes I incorporate it in my dough, which you guys will see today as well. But for all of my other like breads that I've made on this channel, I really just use all-purpose flour. I like that it's cheaper and I you know I don't have a problem with how any of my other baked goods turn out. So we have our starter that we started with, <laughs> our water and the flour that we added in and again these were all like a one to one to one ratio same amount of everything and we're gonna mix this up and it's gonna give like really thick pancake batter vibes. You really don't want it to be too runny and any thicker would be very, very difficult to mix up. But I have heard that you can do three times the amount of water and three times the amount of flour to your starter. And that's just like, a, I guess, a really big feed. But this really works for me, the one to one to one ratio. So as you guys can see, this is a very thick pancakey, you know, texture. And for the purposes of like a good rise video, I'm actually going to be transferring this mix mixture to a new mason jar. This current mason jar that was holding my starter was getting a little crusty and I just kind of felt like it needed a new home. So that is what we're going to do. So this looks a whole lot better. I'm going to go ahead and mark on my mason jar using an Expo or whiteboard marker, just kind of like a little line of where the starter is at as soon as I fed it. And then I'm also making a line where the amount should be when it's doubled. Now this starter I've noticed has been known to more than double, so I'm really looking for for the starter to grow to at least this line on my jar. Then I put on my little piece of fabric and secured it with a hairband. And then I placed my starter under the light of my microwave on top of my stove. This is actually the first time that I've done a time lapse of my starter you know, rising. It's kind of fun to, to watch for me. But during this time, as you guys can see, it's like elapsing. I brought my kids to Starbucks and we did a little outing. So we had a fun time, you know, waiting for the starter to rise. So you can see that it has more than doubled and it may or may not still have room to grow, but my jar is going to, you know, be too small for it at some point. So I'm going to go ahead and assemble my dough now. So to assemble my dough, the first thing that I do is I measure out my water into the bowl that I'm planning on mixing the ingredients in. And in this case, I'm using like a plastic bowl that comes with a lid that I just loosely put on uh, during the rise portions. But if you are, you know, definitely like a sourdough beginner, you've never done this before, a glass bowl might be useful because you can kind of see the level of the dough a little bit better. You can see all the bubbles on the bottom and the sides. 
So, you know, consider using a glass bowl if you are totally new to sourdough. That is what I used when I started with sourdough, but I'm getting a little bit more comfortable, so I've switched to this bowl. Then I take the water that I measured out and I microwave it, you know, in smaller segments just to make sure that I don't have to remeasure my water. And I just want it to be a nice warm, like 90 degrees, nothing too hot, but nothing too cold because the sourdough starter really likes a warm environment. Then I'm going to go ahead and measure out my fully fed and risen starter. And a good, you know, little test to see if it really is ready is it should float on top of the water because it's creating CO2 gas. So if it's not floating, it wasn't ready to be used. But in my case, my starter was nice and, you know, floating and had lots of bubbles. So it was definitely ready to be used. And I go ahead and I whisk that with my water before I add in my flour and my salt. Now I've seen other bakers mix their flour and water together and then put kind of the sourdough on top and kind of mix it in by hand. There's really so many techniques that I've seen people do in my research of sourdough before I got started. And to be honest, a lot of the loaves turn out looking the same. I'm sure they somewhat taste the same too. They all have similar, you know, proportions of ingredients. But I would just say if you're on the fence of starting, you know, your sourdough journey, just get started. You can always try new things, you can improve, and you might actually find that it's, a, you know, a lot less intimidating once you kind of get the hang of it. Anyways, now that my starter and water has been incorporated and mixed together, I am adding in my flour. Now, because I'm cheap, <laughs> the recipe that I originally like kind of looked up, it called for all bread flour. And like I mentioned at the beginning, I really don't want to be spending a ton of money on flour. So I typically save my bread flour for feeding my starter. But in this case, I wanted around 500 grams of flour. So I did 300 of all purpose and then 200 of bread flour. I have experimented in the past and just did all 500 with regular all purpose flour. And again, I really couldn't tell too much of a difference in my loaves. People have also used like rye flour is like really good, I guess, for your starter and for your bread. So there's a lot of variations out there and this is just the one that I'm choosing to do. Now the next thing I'm doing is I am adding in my salt. Some people have recommended adding your salt in after you've let your flour, starter, and water kind of sit for a while, but I have found that that's like more difficult for me to incorporate, so I like to just mix it in at this stage, and again, I haven't noticed much of a difference in my loaves, so I'm going to continue to do what works for me and what is easiest for me. Now, when you mix this together, it's going to feel like really shaggy. <laughs> it's not going to get really well incorporated. There's just going to be a lot of flour that gets stuck to the bowl and it's not going to look real pretty. But you just want to do your best at just incorporating everything. It's okay if there's some flour kind of, you know, left out in little bits, but you want to incorporate this as best as you can, scrape down the sides of the bowl as best as you can, and then you're just going to let it sit for 30 to 45 minutes. Letting it sit will help the flour like be hydrated with the water and the starter that is there and you will notice that as the time goes by as you continue to work with your dough it will get more shiny, it will get more smooth, and it will just become more workable. But do not be discouraged by the state of your dough when you mix this all together. So I covered it and I just put it under the light of my microwave again and I'm letting it sit for 30 minutes and then I will be doing my first stretch and fold. And then what I'm going to be doing is just putting this fed starter in the fridge and it'll stay there for a few days until I'm ready to make sourdough again. But now that the dough has rested, I'm going to wet my hands and do my first stretch and fold. And in this case, I'm not doing like four quarter turns. I'm just kind of going around the circle and stretching it a little bit and really just trying to break apart like the little clumps of flour that are in there and kind of form like a nicer looking ball of dough. Again, it's not going to be perfect and smooth and beautiful because we have to stretch and fold it and then let it rest and do that, you know, over and over and then let the dough rest even longer. So 
Again, it's not going to look perfect. And I'm using wet hands so that it doesn't stick to me as much because it is very sticky. Now, when I was looking up recipes for sourdough before I got into it, everyone was very precise on, you know, how they did their steps and whatnot. And after making, you know, a few loaves myself and noticing like, okay, I'm trying different things, they all end up being about the same. <laughs> so, you know, you don't have to do exactly as many folds as I did. You don't have to turn the bowl exactly at an angle that I did. You can just kind of work your dough into a little ball and see how that works for you. I really feel like sourdough is very forgiving. There's obviously like a general outline of steps that people take, but it doesn't have to be as precise as a lot of other people tend to make it. At least in my opinion, they maybe they're not as precise as I'm taking it, but in my research I felt like everyone was very exact on what needed to be done for the perfect loaf. But now that the dough has been worked with, I'm going to go ahead and cover it and let it sit for 45 minutes, and then we're going to do like a more formal stretch and fold. So again, I'm working with wet hands because the dough still is pretty sticky and we're going to stretch the dough and fold it onto itself. And here I'm doing a you know quarter turn and we're going to be stretching the dough again, folding it onto itself and then repeat that two more times. Now here, you know, I'm kind of tucking it under itself and working it some more than just those four folds, and that's okay. <laughs> it does. You could do five folds if you want, or six. Maybe not go to the extreme of like 30, but, you know, again, it doesn't have to be everything is exactly the same as the YouTube video that you watch. Now that that is done, we're going to cover it and let it sit for another 45 minutes and repeat the process. Now, if you get busy and it sits out for an hour, that's okay too. If you want to do your stretch and fold after 30 minutes because that works with your schedule, that's okay too. But in general, this is kind of the timeline that I try to follow. But again, it's pretty forgiving. And I truly don't believe your sourdough loaf will suffer greatly if you, you know, vary this schedule by like 10 minutes or so, it, it's not gonna matter. So this next little stretch and fold time, I did what's called coil folds. It's where you stretch it up from like the middle and let the two sides that are hanging kind of fold on top of each other. So instead of the folds happening on top, they're happening kind of on the bottom. And this does help kind of create a smoother surface on your dough. And as you can see, I'm kind of just switching things up. I'm not doing stretch and folds every single time. I'm not doing coil folds every single time. And my sourdough loaf is going to turn out great. But now that that is done, I'm covering it and letting it sit out for another 45 minutes. You can see that the dough is like more shiny, it's more smooth, and I'm going to go ahead and fold it some more. And again, I'm using wet hands because the dough still is a little sticky. I don't want it to stick to my hands and it helps kind of with the hydration level in the dough. But this is what it looks like before I let it kind of do this bulk rise. Now I'm done stretching and folding the dough and I'm just gonna let it like sit and relax until it has almost doubled in size. From what I've heard, if it has fully doubled in size, that's kind of risen too much, but you can still bake it. It will still taste like sourdough. It just might not look like what you want it to look like. But at this point, my dough is ready to be shaped. It has bubbles on the sides where it meets the bowl. It has a jiggly surface and there's some bubbles on the top of the dough as well. Again, if you are totally new to sourdough, this is where a glass bowl might be helpful 
because you can see the bubbles like on the bottoms and the sides and you can see really how much action is going on in your dough. So here I'm going to shape the dough, I'm going to flour my surface, and then I even sprinkled a little bit of flour on top of my dough. And I really want gravity just to do its thing and pull the dough onto my work surface. But one thing I have found is helpful in kind of starting the process is kind of giving the sides a little bit of a scrape with like a spatula or even my fingers. So the dough is now on our surface. My bowl is nice and clean. That's, that's a good sign when your dough doesn't like stick to your bowl when it actually just falls right out and now we're going to stretch it out into like a rectangle you kind of want to pop like some of the big bubbles that are sticking out there and then we're just going to fold this over on itself in like thirds and then roll it up like a cinnamon roll and create a nice tight ball of dough now i've seen people shape their dough in a variety of ways. There's no one perfect way to do this. So again, there's some flexibility for you. Don't be too intimidated. This is what I've seen people do and what works for me, but if there's something that's more comfortable for you to assemble your ball of dough, go ahead and try that and see if you like how your loaf turns out. I'm gonna go ahead and pop any like really large bubbles on my surface. And then it's time to place the your little dough ball in its banneton. I really don't have any sourdough specific items so I'm just using a bowl that I have I put a towel on top floured it and I'm plopping the you know ball of sourdough pretty side down the portion of the dough that was on my like countertop surface that's kind of the ugly side and that's going to be facing up in the bowl and I'm just kind of coating the sides of the bowl with some extra flour so that it really doesn't stick when I go ahead and bake it the next day. So on this evening, I was going to try something new because I just kind of continue to experiment with different sourdough methods. And on this night, I let my dough sit out for anywhere from like two and a half to three hours on my countertop before I put it in the fridge for an overnight like rise or whatever. I was originally planning on letting my dough sit out for just like an hour, but then my family went out and did like a little outing and it took a little longer than I had anticipated. But as you guys will see, my sourdough turns out fine. It's okay. And all is well. So it's the next morning and what I'm doing is I'm putting my Dutch oven into my oven and preheating my oven with the Dutch oven in it to about 475 degrees Fahrenheit. As that is getting really, really hot, I'm going to go ahead and transfer my big dough ball to a sheet of parchment paper. In the future, I plan on getting like a special silicone like bread mat for sourdough, but the parchment paper method is working out just fine for me right now. So my floured towel came off nice and clean and spread flour everywhere on my counter. But now what I'm going to go ahead and do is coat the surface of my unbaked loaf with some more flour and I'm going to score the bread with my decorative scores first. I did mark where I plan on making my deeper, longer score, but I'm gonna be doing a scoring technique that I've seen some other bakers do where you actually score your bread six minutes into its bake time. The next thing before we go ahead and bake this is I'm just kind of trimming up my parchment paper to resemble the silicone mat that I was describing earlier. It has little handles and in this way the parchment paper isn't like crowding or taking up a lot of extra space in the Dutch oven. I just kind of like it a little bit better than putting the whole rectangle in. So now that my oven has preheated to 475 degrees and the Dutch oven is very hot, I'm actually going to lower the temperature in the oven to 450 
take out my Dutch oven that's super hot and put my dough into the Dutch oven along with like two ice cubes. And this really helps with the steam in the Dutch oven. It helps the dough continue to expand. And if you don't have a Dutch oven, you can put some ice cubes or boiling water in like a pot also in your oven and just really just to incorporate more steam with your dough. So I'm going to go ahead and set a six minute timer and when that goes off I will be making one final score in my bread. I have noticed that the like outermost layer of the dough about maybe a quarter of an inch thick is somewhat baked and it actually makes scoring the dough a little bit easier or there's like a cleaner look to it. So anyways, that's what I'm doing here. This step could be done prior to any baking and you can just do a nice deep score. This will allow the loaf to expand even more and like hopefully rise up rather than out and kind of create just like a really nice standard sourdough look. So this loaf is going again back into the oven for another 14 minutes. I forgot to mention we bake with the lid on for the first 20 minutes and then we're going to take the lid off for the final 20 minutes and we're also going to reduce the temperature down to 425 degrees. Baking with the lid off is going to now brown your crust and so that's kind of what you can see is happening here. So it's been another 20 minutes of baking for a total of 40 minutes in the oven, half covered, half uncovered. I'm going to go ahead and take out my loaf and let it cool. Now I've seen people cut into the loaf when it's hot because they were so eager to eat the bread, but I've also heard that it's recommended that you wait one or two hours before cutting into your loaf. So I went ahead and let my loaf completely cool before cutting into it. And as you will notice, even though I let it sit out at room temperature before refrigerating, which was something new for me, typically I put it in the fridge right away, even though I did that, it still looks like your standard sourdough loaf. Now, just to give you guys an example of a loaf that didn't sit out at room temperature after shaping and went straight to the fridge after shaping, this loaf did rise a little bit higher than the other one, but as you guys can see, the inside is pretty similar. So like I said, this is a very forgiving dough. It can seem very intimidating to a lot of new bakers, but my biggest advice is just to give it a try get your feet wet, dive into it, and even if your first or second or third loaf doesn't turn out perfect, you will continue to try new things. And like I said before, I think the biggest difference is just how the bread looks, not necessarily how it tastes. If you're just arriving at my channel because you were interested in sourdough and stumbled upon my video, I really hope you found it helpful. And if you like other motherhood content, I would like to invite you to stick around and subscribe. I kind of take care of all things mom on my channel. And if you guys are already subscribed and are just here to follow along on my sourdough journey, I want to thank you guys for watching so much. Thank you for following along. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and I will catch you in the next one. to the end of the video. If you didn't know already, every Monday and Friday you can find motherhood and lifestyle content on this channel. And since us moms have to do it all, that may mean yummy recipes, easy DIYs, mom hacks, cleaning and organization, or just a combo of everything. Please know that you are loved and you are made for greatness, and I will catch you in the next one.